Grayson Grunhafer, Sikkim365.com, joins us now. And Grayson, uh, to say Baylor needed a win last week was was kind of like saying we need oxygen, food, water, and shelter to survive. They they needed a win so badly. They got it against a, a Cincinnati team, admittedly, that's not good. But they did it by making a lot of changes. And there is, the, for the first time, some positivity to go around, you know, after, after like after UCF, I think everybody was kind of like, all right, that's great, but is that just, you did that in this moment in time and can you do it again? They did it. They've got the back half of the schedule coming up. Most of the, you know, all, most of the games are winnable for them. They don't have, you know, the, the more daunting part, but this is still a team that really needs to find itself against a team that's not scuffing like Cincinnati is. Right. And I mean, Cincinnati, I, I know it's, it's not considered a, a great win by any means. And Cincinnati was a team that coming into the year, I expected to be pretty bad. And they've kind of just gone according to the script, I, I think, so far this year. Um, and, you know, Baylor, I, I know that you can point to some things and say, oh, Cincinnati ran all over them. And Cincinnati did this and that to where maybe, you know, people feel like Cincinnati should have won this game. But the fact of the matter is Baylor was up. For most of this game, they were up by two scores for a large chunk of this game as well. Um, so just, you know, in my eyes, this was a, a kind of perfect get right scenario for Baylor. And they were able to come through, get the win on the road. They remain perfect on the road, which is one of the more, you know, weird stat lines uh, of this season so far. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are still some things to work on, obviously. And I, I don't think anyone's sitting here thinking that Baylor's a finished product yet. This, this team is going to have to get better as the season progresses. And they have a really tough test coming up. And a, a test that they really need to stand up to because, you know, they need to compete at home. Because, frankly, you know, their last few outings at home have not lived up to the standard that I think Dave Aranda wants to set for this program. No, it's been 370 days, Emery. Right, 370 days since Baylor won uh, an FBS game at home. This one, not the ideal opponent right now for Baylor in that Iowa State is not a team that's going to win the national title, Grayson, but Matt Campbell has this team playing exactly as he wants them to play. The offensive coordinator change has worked. They're physical. They're tough on defense. They're everything Matt Campbell wants them to be fundamentally now I know that he probably would have not liked to lose to Ohio or some of the games that they've lost this year but the way they've been playing lately is Matt Campbell football yeah and and I mean I think this is a good program and you know Matt Campbell is a guy who gets his players ready for just about every game they play in and so whether or not they're any elite football team or not is kind of besides the point because when you see them play you know they're going to give maximum effort you know their defense is going to play well Um, but on the flip side, you know, if you look at kind of Baylor's track record against Iowa State, uh, even since Dave Randa got there, um, they've competed with Iowa State really, really well. And I think a part of it is, I think the offense that Iowa State runs kind of lends itself to being a little bit more friendly for Baylor's defense. And I mean, even when Baylor was really bad in 2020, they made that a game and definitely scared Iowa State there. And then Obviously, beat them in 2021, beat them last year. And so I'm not going to say that Baylor has their number. I I don't think they necessarily do. But I do think when you look at kind of the offense they run and the system they run, Baylor actually, I think, can can compete with that type of offense because it's much closer to what Utah runs as opposed to, you know, someone like Texas State or Texas or even Texas Tech where they're airing you out and, you know, running all these four and five wide receiver sets that have really given Baylor some problems this year. Yeah, I, I, I think to me the big question is because the, the, the biggest problem that Baylor has is physicality up front on both sides of the ball. So that's Iowa State's strength. So where the rubber meets the road in this game to me is can Baylor match that enough to stay in the game, especially late when those things matter and you, you've been, you know, in, in the, in the, in the trenches for that long. See, and, and that's where I guess I, I, you know, I know that I, I've heard that from other people as well, but I don't necessarily think that's the strength of Iowa State this year. I really don't think that their front, you know, five on the offensive line are really that great or that special. They've struggled to run the football all year. I know the last few games it's gotten better, but 
they're really not a very good rushing team and they don't really move people very well. They don't block particularly well up front either. And then on the defensive side, I think they're good up front, but I, I truthfully think their strength is actually in the secondary. And I, again, I think that bears out by the simple fact that they don't create tackles for loss up front. They're one of the worst teams at sacking the quarterback. It's kind of polar opposites from what Baylor saw against Cincinnati, where Cincinnati was so stout up front uh, and weak in the secondary. This is more so, you know, I think Iowa State's just okay up front, but absolutely elite in the secondary with Jeremiah Cooper and TJ Tampa. Um, I mean, this team's in, I think they're like third in the country in interception. So I, I think that it, it's a little bit different of a matchup than I think people would look at in the past where, you know, the past matchups between these teams have really just been, you know, who's going to win in the trenches. I, I just don't quite know if that's going to be the, the same scenario in this matchup. So Grayson, the um, Baylor still is not, they didn't run the ball much last week and they didn't even hand the ball to running back until like seven minutes left in the second quarter, but they adjusted. Do you expect to see the same thing, or do you think it's going to be kind of like a week-to-week mold the offense to take whatever that defense is going to give you? I think it has to be that second part because, I mean, when they were playing Cincinnati, it was very clear they, they knew they weren't running the football consistently with their running backs. I, I, it was very clear that they knew that was not going to be a thing. You might be able to get some momentum here and there like they had on you know, one of their drives in the second half, they were able to run the football. But outside of that, they did not run the ball well at all. Um, and so I think it's going to depend on the matchup. I, I don't think they can come out this week and, and think that they're going to throw the ball, you know, 40-plus times in this game and feel great about the results because it's going to be hard to complete passes on this secondary if you're not running the ball some. And that brings me back to the other thing, though. I mean, Iowa State's given up at least 106 yards on the ground in every single game this year. That includes games against Ohio and Northern Iowa. And I know Baylor's offensive line hasn't been good, but it should be good enough to get at least 100 or so yards when you compare them to those two offensive lines. And then you look at how Baylor's done when they've ran for at least 100 yards this year. They're averaging 27 and a half points. Um, and when they've ran for less than 100 yards this year, they're only averaging 17 points. So a huge difference and a huge gap there when they are able to get to that 100-yard number, uh, which has been commonplace for opponents against Iowa State this year. So I do think there'll be a greater emphasis on rushing the football while also being sure to take some shots deep, which I, I do think you can hit a few of those against Iowa State, but the consistency in the passing game is going to be difficult to get. What do you think about the changes along the offensive line, which were Colton Price to center, the Barrington boys become the guards, uh, and then uh, – Gavin Byers kicks back out to right tackle where he started the season last year and then was replaced when Khalil Keith got back, but now he's back there at right tackle, where which might be his better position, although I was kind of surprised to see him still in the lineup because, to me, he was the one who'd struggled the most so far this year. Yeah, you know, it's really hard on the offensive line because I think you point to different games and you go, wow, that was that was a really bad game by, you know, this individual or this individual. But the reality of it is when the offensive line is not playing as a cohesive unit, it makes everyone look bad. And, and I, I think we've seen that at times. You know, first game of the year, Tate Williams, a really, really bad performance for him. You saw the Texas Tech game. A lot of people were talking about Campbell Barrington's performance, which, again, tough situation there. Gavin Byers has had his moments as well. But in general, you know, this unit has to play well together. It's more about that cohesiveness as opposed to individual parts. Um, but I liked what I saw uh, from this new group. And for a couple of reasons, I, I think putting Clark Barrington back at guard at least solidifies one position on the offensive line. You know you're going to get good play from him there, which you didn't know you were going to get from him at center. And so I think at least you know you have someone who's played that position at a high level you feel really good about it. So I like that move there. I think Colton Price held up pretty well, especially since his first game of his career was on the road. Um, I think he'll be better as the season goes on. Um, and then at left tackle, it was interesting because they kept rotating Caden Siraki and Alvin Ebosele, um for the game because, like you, I actually thought that it was going to be a potentially Siraki at right tackle um, instead of Gavin Byers, but they elected to – you know, rotate those two young guys and then play buyers at right tackle, which I'm fine with. It gives them a veteran presence. But 
overall, they had to make a change. I'm glad they did. And I think it paid dividends. I, I felt like they did pretty good against Cincinnati, especially in pass protection, which was clearly the game plan. Yeah, I think they might have outthought themselves going into the year on that. Like, sometimes you can do that. Like, you just, oh, we'll do this and this and this, and this is going to be the starting five. And then when it, like, I would have changed it right after Texas State because they just, they were getting so gashed even in that game. I'd have been like, all right, okay, that was, that, let's scrap that experiment. But they kind of dug in on it uh, until the bye. And then when they got their 30,000-foot view, they changed it. Grayson, recruiting-wise, what's coming down the road? It's homecoming week. This is a great time to have guys in uh, and, and make those pitches. Yeah, it definitely is. I, I do want to hit on one note that doesn't have to do with the visits quite yet, but I do think it's a pretty important note. Um, Lancaster four-star running back, uh, Kwon Lacey, uh, he decommitted from Nebraska yesterday. Um, and that was a big storyline because Baylor has stayed in contact with him, continue to recruit him, um, continue to make him a priority, even though he was committed elsewhere, you know, just continuing to kind of be there. And he took an official visit. Uh, back in the summer, and so I think there's still something there, and they're, Baylor's still recruiting him really hard and still trying to potentially land him. Now, he does have some more recent offers, like I believe Florida offered this week, so there is an interesting thing going on there. I think Ole Miss is a player. Alabama may jump back in the mix, um, so a lot of competition, but Baylor is still maintaining a really good relationship with him, which is, I, I think, a pretty big nugget that came out of this past week, but um, and then also the other storyline is Alex Foster, uh, the four-star defensive line commit out of St. Joseph in Mississippi. Um, he's visiting Baylor this weekend, and then next weekend he's taking a trip to Texas, and Texas offered at the beginning of October. So a pretty big storyline there. They're going to visit both schools. Um, we'll see what comes from that. Um, Texas wants him to be the last defensive line uh, commit in their class if they're able to flip him and then obviously Baylor is doing everything they can to hold on to one of the biggest pieces in their 2024 class now outside of that uh, you look at the visitor list for this week and I mean a lot of it is there's commits coming in town and then the 2025 class that uh, seems like it's going to be a huge focal point uh, for recruiting this weekend they got five or six offensive linemen in that class on campus including uh, Duncan Bill 2025 commit to Sean Bryant um, and then a few other guys on that list as well. They're going to be visiting uh, Centennial offensive lineman out of uh, California, uh, Drew Hill. Uh, he's a big-time prospect. He's got double-digit offers. Um, Stanford, one of his, his bigger offers. He's got a few other ones as well. He's going to be visiting uh, from California. He also visited this summer. So uh, a good showing there to get a kid from out of state to come in and visit. Good relationship with Eric Mateos and a guy that uh, they've been recruiting pretty hard. So, I think those are the main storylines. I mean, outside of that, it's a lot of uh, prospects who don't have offers and then some that do uh, in various classes. But, yeah, it should be a very interesting weekend from high-level talent who's going to be on campus. Grayson Grudenhead for Sikkim365.com. If you're not a member of the premium section, you can do that at Sikkim365.com and read Grayson stuff. Grayson, thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. All right. Grayson Grudenhead for next up. Our weekly 